welcome to When Burnout Becomes Reality, a podcast that combines lived experience with the scientific knowledge of burnout to help listeners prevent, recover and grow from burnout. My name is Shannon Swales, a human and clinical psychologist with both lived experience and scientific knowledge and skills in burnout. It is my hope that the values of authenticity, compassion, wisdom and community shine through in each and every episode of the pod. Episodes that share my own and others' lived experiences of burnout and interviews expert guests to help listeners build awareness and hope to prevent, recover and grow from burnout. The views, opinions, tips and the like expressed by myself or my guests are not a replacement of personalised therapy. Just like I have done for myself and many of my guests, I encourage those of you that are suffering to seek professional help. On the 10th of the 10th, 2023, World Mental Health Day and smack bang in the middle of Queensland, Australia Mental Health Week, myself, Shannon Swales, Sarah Coopers, the author, best-selling author of The Thriving Giver, Carolyn Grant, People Plus Science and author of leadership legacy and Nicola Browning a strong advocate for lived experience particularly with her own burnout experience. They we all came together to deliver a uh, a virtual event focused on burnout and learning and delivering as much uh, wisdom as we could answering some really pertinent questions around the signs and symptoms the causal factors, not just individually like things like perfectionism, but also uh, culturally within the workplace, things like uh, leadership styles and workload. And the really beautiful thing about this uh, panel event, this Q&A, is that those who attended also shared some of their stories and challenges as well, creating a... uh, a collective uh, care response in continuing to really understand this phenomenon of burnout and how to go about preventing it but also recovering it. So I'm so glad I had the opportunity to record this event with everyone involves consent and be able to distribute this on the pod as well for your viewing. So please, yeah, grab a cuppa. Uh, or whatever you'd like to um, have a drink with and sit back and enjoy the proceedings. Take care. Hey, so hi and welcome everyone to When Burnout Becomes Reality panel discussion and Q&A. My name's Shannon and Swales and I'll be your host this evening. I'll introduce myself a little bit more soon. But first I'd like to acknowledge, um, to do an acknowledgement of the country. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Turbal people, which is the place in which I deliver this uh, Q&A tonight. I'd like to acknowledge uh, elders past and present, as well as the emerging leaders, and also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders present here today. So um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. As some of you may see in the chat, I've just indicated that if you can pop your um, video and audio off, Uh, Just for the first 40 minutes, we will, when we open up to questions from the audience, you're welcome to um, turn your video back on if you wish, of course. And another reminder that this event is recorded for others who couldn't make it tonight and for you to view back if you wish as well. Um, I think I remember everything there in terms of those things. Um, With, you know, tonight is educational. Um, However, things might be triggering for you. And if so, In Australia, I mean, wherever you are in the world, please access your services, your mental health services, your people, doctors, um, your friends, your family. Here in Australia, I just like to point out Lifeline's number, which is 13114, and also 13 Yarn, which is our Indigenous um, counselling line as well, which is 139276. So just a reminder of the structure of this uh, Q&A tonight. So the first 40 minutes will be uh, me asking questions of this lovely panel who I'll introduce soon. 
um, who are going to share their wisdom around burnout. Uh, and then 20 minutes, hopefully, uh, we definitely want to get to your questions as well and answer as many as we can. Feel free to leave your questions in the chat, but so they don't get lost, um, feel free to maybe do them sort of closer to that, that time as well. But of course, there'll be opportunity to actually ask your question, question live if you wish, um, but to know that that chat format is there as well. Uh, so yes, I'd love to introduce um, the panel who I'm just so blessed to chose to be part of this tonight because they each have so much wisdom to share. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Nicola Browning. So Nicola, if you can um, do a bit of a wave so they know um, who who you are. So Hi Nicola's, everybody. Okay. Nicola's all the way from Perth, uh, Western Australia, and Nicola is a retired nurse with 30 plus years across public, private, not-for-profit and corporate sectors. So quite a wide experience there. Um, she's a health advocate, change maker and burnout lived experience and mother of three. And then we have Sarah Coopers. Um, Sarah, do you mind? Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hey, Sarah comes all the way from the UK, which is morning over there at the moment. So I'm very blessed to have her here as well. Now, um, Sarah has a master's um, in a research science on burnout and stress in health professionals. She's a best-selling author, and I've read this book. It's fantastic. The Thriving Giver, and a lecturer, trainer, resilience coach, and a mother of three boys. So welcome, Sarah. And then rounding off the panel is uh, Carolyn Grant. Uh, and yep. Hi. 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 <laughs> Carolyn is, a C is the CEO of People Plus Science, organizational advisor, researcher and publisher of Psychological Safety Benchmark in Boards and Organisations, author of the, uh, I'll get this right, the Legacy Leadership Book and a Mother of Three Boys. Seems to be a three theme amongst yeah. us for some reason. <laughs> so welcome um, to our panel of experts and lovely human beings um, as well. And as I mentioned, I'm Shannon Spells. I'm your host for tonight. And I am a, or I work as a clinical psychologist. Um, recent author um, of Nothing Left to Give, podcaster, When Burnout Becomes Reality. I love that title. Um, burnout Psychology Support is my private practice, uh, burnout lived experience, and I am a furry care caregiver um, of two that are still with me, but one who's passed on. So there's a three theme with me as well, just the furry kind. <laughs> so that is us. Um, and I. so we're going to get straight into it, but I'm going to start us off with just introducing um, what is burnout and sort of where we're coming from in terms of the definition we're using uh, just to set the scene there because that's what we're talking about tonight. And I want to repeat the words of um, the top researchers in the burnout field, which is Maslach and um, I'm probably going to pronounce their name, last name wrong, but Lita, L-E-I-T-E-R. So their definition of burnout is that burnout is a psychological syndrome emerging as a prolonged response to chronic interpersonal stress on the job. The three key dimensions of this response are overwhelming exhaustion, I say mind, body and soul, uh, feelings of cynicism and detachment from one's job, and a sense of ineffectiveness and a lack of accomplishment. So I'm going to cross to Sarah first tonight for the first question to share her wisdom. So Sarah, if I can call on you, You've delved into the literature of burnout and have worked with caregivers across your working life. What are some of the behavioural patterns that increase vulnerability to burnout for others? Oh. One of the main challenges of anyone working in a health or caring profession or informally as a caregiver is that it's a vocation for us. Our work is, and when our work is a vocation, it's so easy for us to overextend ourselves. We're passionate about what we do. We want to make a difference in people's lives. And that can often lead to a pattern of overgiving. So sometimes you might feel like you're giving and giving and giving. I call it the overgiver syndrome. So overgivers tend to be brilliant at looking after everybody else but we tend to ignore our own needs. And that was certainly me before I burnt out. And it's been, I've seen a similar pattern in so many of the health and caring professionals that I've coached and trained over the years. And also there's a growing body of literature supporting that whole concept. So this overgiver syndrome 
can manifest in different types of ways for different people. And one of them is the tendency to want to keep everybody happy, to please people, or to avoid upsetting people. And when you're when you have those patterns, it's very hard to say no or to set clear boundaries because you don't want to upset anybody. And your in the inability to set clear boundaries or say no to unreasonable requests makes it much harder to manage stress effectively or to create time to nurture and care for yourself. So that's one incredibly common pattern in many, many health and care professionals that definitely increases the risk of burnout. Another similar pattern is the tendency to be over responsible for others. We take unnecessary responsibility for others, and that might be in our personal lives or in our professional lives. So the balance of responsibility, of responsibility for our others and responsibility for ourselves is really important to find a balance, a balance between giving to others and also giving and caring for ourselves. That's an important balance that we need to be aware of all of the time, because when we're over responsible for others, we tend to lack responsibility for ourselves. We don't tend to prioritize our own well-being because we're prioritizing everybody else. So those are two really common patterns. And another one is not allowing yourself time to relax or to stop or to go out and meet up with your friends. Maybe because you feel uncomfortable or you feel guilty taking that time out for yourself because your role is to look, and, look, and care, look after and care for others. But if we don't allow ourselves that time for relaxation, replenishment, nurturing ourselves, then it's really hard to carry on giving of our best to others. So I see those common themes so often in many, many health and care professionals that significantly increase their risk of burning out. Uh, so the key is to be aware of which of those behavioral patterns within ourselves that are increasing our risk of burnout. Where is the balance of giving to others, giving to ourselves? Where's the balance of responsibility for others or stepping back and allowing them to take more responsibility for themselves? And those patterns are often quite deeply embedded in us. So it takes a, a, a lot of conscious effort and it's possible to make changes. And I go into this in a lot more depth in my book, but I hope that gives you a, a brief overview about those disempowering patterns that increase the risk of burnout and it's possible to change them that's the key thank you so much Sarah I'm nodding my head so much so yeah <laughs> I'm like yeah all three um you know my own burnout experience as well and working with people yeah certainly see those patterns of behavior so sharing and I love that it is possible to change but end at the same time acknowledging how ingrained they are so it does take a lot of conscious effort, but it's possible. And um, yeah, so thank you um, for that wisdom. So I'm going to cross over to Nicola next. Um, Nicola, um, you have experienced firsthand as as um, you have shared with me um, your experience, um, what it's like to burn out. And I was interested in what have you come to know was your path into burnout? Um, yeah, the triggers, I suppose, all those things. Yeah. Yeah, I'm nodding as well with Sarah because I'm yes, that resonates with my lived experience. But um, I think sort of just to give a summary, when I experienced burnout in 2020, um, I now know it's not for the first time in my life. I'd definitely been there before, but I didn't read the signs and I chose not to reach out for help and support where I really did need it at that time. Um, I was more comfortable, like Sarah was saying, taking care of others in my 20s, 30s and 40s. Um, then sitting with my own experience 
experiences and feelings and that discomfort that you talk about. Um, I didn't make self-care a priority. I didn't take time to check in with myself when I wasn't being honest with myself um, or my loved ones or my colleagues. Um, and that was very much not really being honest with how I was struggling with anxiety. Um, and I just kept going. And, you know, I now know that to be that I was experienced that trauma and that PTSD that, you know, had built up over a career. Um, so I just kept going and I threw myself into being busy at work and at home. And I guess I, over time, I became more dis disconnected from people who cared about me, um, which is never a good idea either. Um, so it's that slippery slope, but, but I experienced different peaks and troughs. So I just kept going. Um, and then in my early career, I was following my true vocation and my childhood dream to, you know, nurse. So I was really thriving. And I think when Sarah talks about her book, The Thriving Giver, that early career was thriving. You know, I was connected to my purpose. I've moved out of home. I'd found my nurse tribe. Um, I got supportive mentors and regular clinical supervision. I've got ongoing professional development and the health system did at that time, the NHS, because I'd started in the UK. Um, there was really good supported career progression. So I was embracing every, everything and every, you know, everything that came my way. Um, and that was both in clinical and corporate. Um, so I had to be agile and change and put myself out of my comfort zone. But I can honestly say I loved everything that I was doing, but I was very aware when things weren't going quite so well, but I just continued. So then sort of there was that awareness, I guess, of people face stresses in nursing back in the 80s and 90s, but there certainly wasn't the same awareness of the challenges that, and I'll refer to nurses, but I am talking obviously about health professionals and people across every health and um, working sector now are raising these issues. But I will speak obviously just from the nursing perspective. Um, and there wasn't that, there was still the stigma about actually speaking out about things, um, reaching out for help and support. And the term burnout really didn't exist. It was stress or you debriefed or, you know, you debriefed on critical, critical incidents or, um, you know, workload challenges. So again, that's all a pathway to burnout, but it wasn't really discussing that final place that you might get to um, really. So then um, I think probably the final part me actually now really looking back on my career now I'm in that retirement and made the hard decision to leave nursing was that my warning signs and triggered had been varied because of different chapters in my life throughout my career um, and also throughout that burnout journey um, so I kind of have summarized them just because some might resonate with people and that's what I needed the most when I was struggling so I've just put them as when life changes in an instant and it set me off on a spiral of uncertainty and emotional distress. So there's things in my personal and professional life. So say, for example, I would lose a loved one and then I would go to work and I would be caring for people who are losing their loved ones. So that's, you know, again, I would find that as an empath and someone who's very compassionate, extremely distressing. And you would do that layer on layer on layer. Um, and then I've put that when fe life felt unbalanced and I was trying to keep everything going and it seemed really impossible at times. Again, those were triggers and warning signs, but I wasn't listening. Um, and then thoughts and feelings and the choices that I was making were impacting me in a negative way, such as then my physical health, my mental health, my sleep, my energy levels, relationships. Um, and then I would shift away from the positive habits and behaviors that Sarah talks about. Um, and I wouldn't embrace and prioritize them it was the first thing to go um and then I think I would know my energy at work and my commitment and my drive and that whole momentum when I'm thriving that would just start to deplete uh, and again those were signs that I was needing rest I was needing recovery so again very obvious trigger um, and then I think when I slowly withdrew and became disconnected from others, whether that was my loved ones meeting up with friends, again, just what Sarah was saying. Um, and that was very hard for me because I'm a very happy, positive social person. Um, so, yeah, not actually recognizing what I was doing at the time um, when I became quiet. Um, and then I think I became disengaged and disconnected. And that probably was happening in the workplace. And I was just saying, no, I'm OK. You know, don't worry about me. I was too busy worrying about the team I was working with or managing. 
And then I think the examples and challenges and stresses and the difficulties that I faced throughout my career at completely different points in time from being an 18 year old student nurse all the way to being an expert or a, you know, a leader or a manager were things like, and again, I, I would ask you to reach out if you're experiencing these and they're really troubling you and the systems where you work or the policies and the processes just seem so difficult. Things like bullying in the workplace and my feeling of exclusion and that so desperate need for belonging. There were times where I definitely experienced that and then imposter syndrome sort of creeps in. All of these words and topics, this is what I researched and read more about. So I'd encourage you to do the same. Things like sexual harassment in the workplace as a young 20 year old nurse, not great. Um, and I didn't know where to turn to support, but luckily I had some great peers who stepped in straight away and supported me through the process. A medication error, one of the ones that I remember, and it happens to people every day, but the emotional you know, process that you go through with that. I worked in critical care and intensive care for a number of years, both with babies to adults and older people. So there you'll experience that vicarious trauma, but again, in mental health, you know, lots of other workplaces, there are different elements to that vicarious trauma. And I needed to do a lot of reading about that. Psychologists and counselors tend to get a lot of education in that space, but as nurses in my particular time, we didn't. So again, lots of learning. Things like loss and grief and care, stress and trauma. My young daughter at 19 had a stroke um, and she's recovered really well. But then I was becoming a carer um, and I've had different losses in my life where my role has been both inside of work, extremely stressful, but then outside of work, what you are carrying. Um, and no matter how hard we try, we do take that with us wherever we go. Um, but again, I didn't really reach out to tell people how much I was struggling. Um, so I just kept going. Things like ill health or an illness or a new diagnosis. Um, and I would say things like mental health. I had a severe back injury, you know, in my early career. Um, and again, I hadn't really looked back on it until I started thinking about today and what I would talk about and go, well, there were so many different things impacting my career over those, you know, many, many years, all very different. And then the obvious ones that are talked about with burnout, which you've mentioned already, the unhealthy workplace cultures, that whole psychologically unsafe space where you won't necessarily reach out for support. You want a trusted other person. Um, and not all of us always find that person in our workplace. Luckily, I did. And I was able to find a trusted person and um, a good friend at work. Um, and that started to really help me heal and understand what was happening and um, I had in other workplaces in intensive care units where you're working with like-minded people and you do look after each other but it's um yeah when things get really tough and I think relentless workloads and being adaptable and agile and around COVID that definitely and being isolated in an isolated role or in an isolated workplace and then being so isolated from family that really did impact me as I know it will have done many many other people around the world um, and I think probably the final things are, I think the healthcare system um, that I've experienced, there have been good and bad and ugly. There are positive as well and EAP, whatever the first step is. But I would say the best thing that I decided to do was get to my GP, go and visit them and say, I'm now physically and emotionally exhausted. And I was finally listening to my body, but it was way too late down the line and the impacts had really happened then. So um, yeah, I think, I know that's a lot, but I wanted to touch on all of those things because I think even if one of those things resonates with someone um, and the need to act early and step in and early intervention prevention is so much better than getting to the point of my career where I waited so long because yeah we weren't taught what I'd like to think now people are learning and people with lived experience I think when my triggers were there I started to understand what was happening mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much Nicola and and from the heart um you know just what you said there I just want to give it all because if one thing resonates uh and I can really see that what Sarah shared about the overgiving um there was so much you know professionally and personally and uh, and thank you for sharing the personal stuff too because we're not separated from our jobs what what's affecting us emotionally outside is affecting the human that turns up to work <laughs> so and then the stuff that as a human at work you're experiencing as well and how that contributes to to um 
our emotional health and well-being. Um, so thank you for sharing that and indicating the system factors too. You know, it, you know, it's not um, yes, there's some individual factors that lead us down to to burnout, but system factors. And if we don't have a safe environment or a safe other um, that we can connect to um, at work, that makes it a hell of a lot harder. And that culture back then of, um, I mean, we're getting better as a society, but that, and as workplaces, but that culture of around mental health being such a stigma and people not yeah, talking up um, for that reason. But I'm glad you found a person and um, found your GP and um, reached out. Anyway, I'm going to shift over to Carolyn. Hey, Carolyn. Um, so you have worked um, with the organisational side of things, particularly working with leaders. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to delve a little bit more into what system factors put someone at risk of burnout that, you know, Nicola has certainly touched upon in her own personal experience. But, yeah, look, yeah, share away. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I love listening to Nicola because it just validates a lot of what we're seeing come through in our research and, and the work that we're doing at the moment. Um, and I think firstly, you know, we've got leaders that are, are really in a crisis themselves at the moment. You know, we've got one third saying that they are, are experiencing depression at the moment. We've got more than 60% of who we've been talking to that are they're indicating that they are at high levels of stress and exhaustion and feeling burnout themselves. Um, but I think the the interesting factor is that only 15% of those leaders feel that they're equipped to actually deal with staff that are suffering from burnout. So I think for one is that we, we actually need to actually put some um, support systems around our leaders to actually start supporting the people that are within the organisation. The other is that I love the way that you talked about the, the different levels that we spoke about individual and we spoke about um organizational and then there's that one in the middle which is around teams and I think what we've tended to do in the past is we've said okay you're, you're expressing yeah you're experiencing stress or burnout we, we need to build your resilience because clearly you're not resilient enough for this job so let's work on that um, and and I think the problem is that from an individual's perspective there are a lot of things that we can be doing and working with, and some of it is around building our resilience some of it's around our self-awareness but we've got these great uh, opportunities to work as a team because we're a member of a team and going back to Nicola's point I had a I had a great tribe and your team should be that tribe and that should be where that inclusivity and that welcoming comes from so what are we doing about that peer support within that um, and then our leader has such you know 70 percent influence on that team and that team environment so what are we doing again to actually give those leaders those skill sets to be able to support the team they're in and actually create that positive environment and then from an organisational level, we're looking at things like their policies and their procedures, their responsiveness to consumer complaints, but also the, the feedback and information that's coming in from their employees. Um, and, and how are they actually creating interventions that, that actually work from an individual, a team and an organisational level to actually create that overall support? Um, what we're seeing a lot of um, is again, we've got amazing caregivers and health workers that are coming in with a great sense of purpose. Um, and unfortunately, when that starts to erode, when we're disempowering our staff where they can't make decisions knowing what needs to be done because they've got to go back through a, a really long bureaucratic process where we might be talking about consumer-centred care, but in fact, we know that it's a financial decision that's being made and we start disempowering those people and, you know, eroding a lot of that purpose, that becomes a real issue. Um, we've got a lot of shortages at the moment. So roles and responsibilities are lacking clarity where we've got people that are highly stressed needing to upskill or get that little bit more of extra training, but not getting that. And that's just causing another sense of... Um, opportunities for that whole self-criticism to come in and to actually start saying I'm not good enough here I don't know what I'm doing to that level of uncertainty I don't know what I'm dealing with I'm not sure what this patient's going to do what if I upset them what if I hurt them what if I do more harm um, so they're the sorts of uncertainty and fear levels that we're kind of creating by not actually giving appropriate training and support um, and some really good examples of that are, you know, we, we stop buddying systems really early in home care areas and some work with disabilities where we should be actually extending that. Um, to Nicola's point, um, you know, when we're exposed to um, traumatic events and some of that is, you know, we're, we're experiencing um, 
the results of serious neglect and abuse in some cases to actual um, death or near death incidences. So, you know, where are our debriefs? Um, we say we do them, but in fact, when we did the research, only about 12% of debriefs are actually occurring in organisations. Um, and sometimes they'll use employment assessment programs and they're saying they don't understand where we're coming from. There's no continuity of care. So I'm repeating my program or repeating my, you know, my story every time. So what can we do to actually provide better peer support um, across the industry as well? Um, and, I, and I think I want to just highlight too that we've actually probably got a lot of sole practitioners here. So it might not be from an organisational perspective, but when we've got sole practitioners and business owners who come from a really great experience of I've got this skill set and I'm really great at it, to then suddenly they're a business owner having to do business development, marketing, manage their accounts, their finances. Um, potentially there's a whole lot of other stresses that are now going on that aren't necessarily around their caregiving or around their health profession. It's, it's all these other things that are coming in where we try to think we can actually be great at all of them um, and we start to struggle a little bit and we're not. Um, so, so in terms of your tribe, sometimes it's about where are some of the other small business owners as opposed to some of the healthcare professionals to actually help me get, um, you know, get support around these things. Um, that's what I'm seeing at the moment. Um, so when you look at, some of the things that you're talking about, um, so around trauma and having the right support systems, having really good support networks, um, looking at individual interventions, team interventions and, and organisational ones are, are the best that we've seen. Thank you so much, Karen. There's so much that I want to reflect on there, but I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to go. But thank you. So much wisdom there. Sarah, back to you. Um, so I've, as I've already mentioned, I've had the pleasure of reading your book and particularly at a time as I moved back into my profession after burnout. So, um, so benefited greatly from your direction in that um, to become a thriving giver, going back into that giving profession. Um, and you introduced a number, a lot, <laughs> valuable, um, helpful, simple, but effective tools to do just that, to become a thriving giver. And I was wondering if you can share one or two with, with the um, audience here today. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share very briefly about a few tools and referring back to what both Nicola and Carolyn were talking about is one of the challenges of working in any health or caring profession is that we're working with people who are often traumatized, distressed, suffering in pain, and that can have an impact on us. And especially if there is no debriefing after critical incidents, we need a process to help ourselves process and release our own distress and upset and mental turmoil around what's been happening. And it's not just the stress of from work. Also, we're inevitably going to be affected by stressful factors in our personal lives. So the first tool I'd like to share with you is expressive writing. Now, Often people think, oh, I always do, do journaling. So I'm going to highlight some of the differences between expressive writing and journaling, because there's a phenomenal amount of research being done by a social psychologist Pennyback on specifically expressive writing, where you spend 15 or 20 minutes writing down all of your thoughts and feelings and emotions about whatever is troubling you. And that process of setting aside the time and preferably setting a timer is incredibly valuable because you're labeling your emotions. You're probably discovering deeper layers of emotions. You're setting your thoughts down on paper and apparently writing the very process of writing is, is in fact more cathartic than talking about something because it accesses a different part of the brain. I thought that was interesting. So with expressive writing, it tends to be something that you use, you use as and when you need it. And the research is often being done. So inviting people to write for three or four consecutive days, because often you might empty yourself out that first day, but there's more to write, there's more to write. And one of the key differences between expressive writing and journaling is that you're invited to write on loose sheets of paper. You can also do this on a laptop, but often loose sheets of paper, and you don't have to worry about spelling, punctuation, grammar, you simply write, emptying yourself out, whether it's allowing expressions of all, all that anger and upset or turmoil or distress or pain, whatever it is, 
this is a great opportunity, get it down on paper. But the key is when you finish writing, you let it go. You discard it, you tear it up, shred it up, scrunch it into a ball, burn it, whatever you need to do. If you're on a laptop, then put it in the trash can, empty the trash can. Because the very process of letting it go is incredibly cathartic. In fact, I gave a copy of my book to my local family doctor, the GP, and she said the expressive writing was what was her go to tool through COVID. That's what really supported her. And she loved tearing it up and chucking it away at the end. And the process of letting it go also means that it's very safe for you to be really, truly, deeply honest. Because I know some people I've worked with, they've done journaling for many years, but they didn't dare write down what they really wanted to write in case anyone read it. So with the process of discarding and letting go is, I believe, incredibly helpful. And in letting it, that writing is normally painful, traumatic. So it's let it go. Whereas journaling, often you might have positive reflections, something else. So you might want to keep those reflections. So that's one incredibly valuable tool that supports not only psychological well-being, but also this endless research showing, showing the benefits in terms of our physical health. Because when we keep things locked up inside, that has an impact on our health and our well-being. So that's tool number one. And then very briefly, I'd like to share with you three simple tips about saying no. Because saying no is a, such a key element of learning how to manage pressure and stress. If we're always saying yes to everyone, that everything that people ask us to do, we're going to become overburdened. We're never going to have the time to take care of ourselves. So the three tips are, if somebody asks you to do something, listen, pay attention to the feelings in your body. Because often you might notice a clenching of your teeth, a tightness of your shoulders, a sinking in your stomach. Your body is giving often a very clear message. It might be better to say no. Uh, and in a work situation, you may need to say yes, but it's really helpful to know what your body's how your body is responding. Then the second tip, and this is particularly good in, in, in personal life, I'll think about it and get back to you. Now, this is a wonderful tip for people whose instantaneous response when someone asks them to do something is, yes, I'll do it. I'll think about it and get back to you, gives them time, gives them to really reflect, do I want to do this? And maybe gather the courage to say no. The third tip around saying no is start with the easiest situations first. So in my book, I encourage people to write a list of 10 situations they'd like to say no. And then I, I invite them to put it in, in order. What's easiest? Because we want to practice in those easiest situations first and develop our confidence and skills in those easy situations. And then we can gra gradually develop our skills. So often it's much easier to practice in your personal life. Work situations, especially within an organization, it can be more tricky. Uh, I go into this again in a lot more depth in my book, but I, I do believe that the expressive writing and the saying no are absolutely key tools. So I hope you find them valuable. Thank you, Sarah, for yeah sharing yeah some very valuable tools there. And I did that one, setting the ten and <laughs> practicing with the um, the easiest first. So thank you for that. Um, definitely very helpful. So back over to Nicola. Um, and so having you know, certainly worked through um, in your recovery with burnout, and I know it's, if, if I've got an ongoing thing, but certainly made a lot of um, sort of ground as well. I was wondering if you could share with the audience what's helped you, you know, if, um, a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll touch on like what Sarah's just been talking about because I was probably doing it without realising. So I've mentioned that my daughter had a stroke um, at 19 and obviously life changed in a moment and it was literally a sliding door moment. And um, I didn't realise that when we got involved and I started volunteering, because as usual, I 
stepped into something when uh, I was working um, and kept giving more. But I actually, it was really helpful because I eventually stopped work and I took a break. And that's when I did burn out because I've kept going, trying to do everything. But I did as part of the Young Stroke Project and with my daughter, we learned about lived experience. And I think a lovely friend of mine is on this uh, webinar today. And we've talked often about um, the the gift of lived experience and how we share it, how we talk to other peers. And I think during that process, Sarah, I was creatively writing and going through this process as well as reaching out to a psychologist and finally sitting down with someone and doing the same. So it was twofold, but I also did journaling as well. So, but not everything all of the time. At different times, I chose a different tool and I did it in a different way, but I honestly can say either having a voice and using your voice to share and your story if you choose for me it was very very therapeutic and it was very validating um and it really did help and I really wish I'd done that sooner um but also what you said actually putting pen to paper and sitting with my own feelings which I talked about I didn't do very well over my years it, I also did that so absolutely and that was without reading your book so now I just have to read all the other chapters but I think the one thing is reaching out for professional help so seeing my GP and what I will say is I was fascinated even as a nurse and knowing what the science is how my body my blood tests and what was showing up as far as stress went in my body was really quite an eye-opener and a slippery slope and those stresses and how my immune system you know and being in that flight and flight response and in a stress response for a long period of time really wasn't helping and to this day I have ups and downs of revisiting that so that is why it's not only good for your mental health if you need to reach out to see a counselor or a psychologist but also your physical health and the impacts on your body of ongoing stress so I think I wanted to sort of say that helped I found that I actually knew what was going on for me um, and it was a real relief to unburden myself I think to be vulnerable to be brave and my daughter taught me this after her stroke what she shared and where she dug deep to she taught me to do that and I started breaking down all the walls and barriers so it was a real empowering experience I think um, and it felt okay. Um, and that's what I wanted to share with people today. It actually is okay. And even if you have one person that's got your back and can walk that journey, it's the best thing that you can do. And guess what? It all gets better from there, <laughs> is, is my personal feeling. That's the hardest bit um, in, in my personal experience. And then I think for me, I had to take the time to rest, reflect, recover, reset, reimagine and I've talked about these hours in different posts and little blogging and writing that I've done but um Shannon and I connected over burnout a different kind of gap year I until I spoke to people with lived experience and I heard how they put the words and framed things I honestly didn't know what was happening I felt really lost and then I was like hey it's okay I'm having a different kind of gap year I'm going to step away from my career I'm going to put myself first and my family first and I was able to yes there's compromises yes it was stressful but it would be far better to have me here than not have me here so I think it was getting to that tipping point um and then the reflection time was really interesting I and you, if you speak to a lot of other people who've been through burnout we all do the same thing we deep dive we write, read every book every article every bit of research and find people who are like-minded whether that's on LinkedIn Facebook Instagram I explored and it was and I was curious and it was really invigorating and it actually felt made me feel felt better and then because I wanted to be a thriving giver again and I love your term Sarah and it's something that really sat with me and one person that I met during this time through connecting with my peers who were nurses or health professionals but also like-minded people who'd experienced burnout and recovery and what they were doing now was Athol Han who's a nurse leader and nursepreneur and I know that we'll share some of his information I've done a podcast um, with Shannon talking a lot more about the burnout no more course I went and educated myself and I think I thrive on being curious and learning and growing as do a lot of people and that made me feel like no I'm still worth this and I can get back to work or I can get back to being Nicola again because I really felt who's Nicola anymore I was really lost for a while um, and so during that time I think he taught me 
most of the skills and the tools that I needed to find my way forwards. And we joke about that, that because it's his organization and forwards is the way, but it was for me. And so I did things like I prioritized time with my family. I found some balance and calm and quiet time. I also embraced a time for my health and my exercise and my wellness and all of the things people talk about self-care, but obviously I had ignored those for a long time. Volunteering was great. It kept me with a purpose that really meant something to me. I'd been a neuro nurse all my career and, you know, now my daughter was going through and experiencing something that I could also hopefully help with. So that's what we also did. Um, and then this period that I learned from another lovely person I met through the Young Stroke Project of post-traumatic growth. And this is where there's hope and there's purpose and there's something really, again, empowering when you've been through these difficult times is that I've grown through this time and I've learned a lot more about myself. And, you know, there's things that I do every day now and the things that have helped are things like meditation and mindfulness, which I wanted to read more about, um, you know, journaling when I need to and where it's useful for me. Um, but being kind to myself and saying it's OK, it doesn't have to be every day. It's just when it means something. Um, things like reading, gardening and going back to playing my guitar, just little things and moments in time that I've read recently, not just about triggers, but glimmers. So have a bit of a research what people are talking about glimmers at the moment. And there's a lot more of those times in recovery. And that's, again, those periods of positive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now it's been a period of reset and reimagining what the future looks like because I've had a career break. I've now decided that my identity isn't as a nurse because you know, I'm retiring and actually it would be better for me to make a change. So I'm embracing now that kind of new beginning of what's my voice? How can I advocate for others who maybe don't have a voice? How can I support my peers who are going through burnout? Um, I love to teach. I love to mentor and coach. So I'm reimagining what that will look like and just about to embrace some co-research and lived experience for the Young Stroke Service in Australia. So there are lots of wonderful ways that we can get back to life or get back to career um, and it might look a little bit different than it did before or it might look the same but um, I would definitely say that I've now got tools in my toolbox and um, you know Athel and the burnout course helped me but absolutely every person who I had the privilege of learning about their lived experience helped me um, along the way so Shannon you're one of those people Athel and then a lovely person called Saran who I and I went on the Young Stroke journey together so I'll be forever grateful and if I can ever help or support anyone or they just want to share um, and connect and I can give them any you know those resources then um, let me know. Thank, thank you so much Nico I really appreciate that I'm mindful of time I'd love to reflect of yeah no all good. I, yeah I'm like <laughs> tribe help there's so many things but uh, the audience have heard it we've captured this so yes um carolyn um last question over to you before we open up to the audience um so what have you come to see are the changes and, and i think you've started to talk to this um before but what have you come to see are the changes that organizations need to foster to prevent or assist someone experiencing burnout and yeah i feel like starting to talk to that yeah yeah i think um i think given we've got limited time one of the things you know we've got a, a new whs um focus which is really on psychosocial hazards and uh, if there's anything that i'd love to encourage people to do is to make sure that they take that quite seriously because the framework that is within that in terms of talking to each of your employees, identifying what their individual hazards are, getting them to um, assess um, the impact, the frequency, um, and, uh, and and then looking at different ways to mitigate those as a team, as an individual. That is really critical. And, and I think we stop at doing assessment or we might, you know, hand it over to WHS. So I think to me, if we can get that right, as a lead indicator, understanding psychological safety, you know, we need to be able to have people that feel safe to speak up, that actually feel like they are included and part of a team where they feel that they are empowered to challenge the status quo and improve the delivery of care that they're giving um, and to actually feel safety to learn and, and make mistakes on the job and actually go, okay, that's okay, we can we can fix that, we can work with that, or how do we how do we mitigate those risks? So, so to me, that's the lead indicator and, and too often we're looking at lagging indicators like hazards um, when we actually should be looking at fostering the right environment. And a lot of that looks at skill sets, 
You know, let's make sure that we can actually have difficult conversations. Let's actually look at that we're approachable, that we know how to take feedback and receive feedback. Uh, let's look at some of the social intelligence and um, some of our self-awareness so that we actually know the impacts that we're having on others and then look at self-awareness and, and our own regulation. So I think that that's probably where I would start. I would have been right, Carolyn, like often what is called the soft skills, but the, like, I'm not sure if I'm using the right term there, but these interpersonal skills that are needed, like things like being able to have difficult conversations and yeah, that, that often things that were called yeah, soft skills are what is actually needed, um, uh, you know, in our systems, uh, you know, to be able to have, you know, to be able to create the safe environment, as you said. Mm. Yeah, we, we never, um, and you know what, our training still, becomes very much around skills and technical skills we're still not allowing that budget to actually have these conversations and to really look at these um i, I call them essential skills because yeah, soft skills yeah. kind of <laughs> that's a better name better name um yeah. because it gives that judgmental and that's why i don't like that term either that's lovely never thought about essential yeah. skills exactly exactly yeah. bing 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 <laughs> and and uh, anyway yeah we could talk for ages about that but <laughs> But I really want to allow time for those, uh, for the audience. Um, so this is a time now and feel free if you want to turn your video on, um, but know that we're still recording for the benefit of those watching back who couldn't make it. Um, I'm just going to switch to gallery view. So I will see you guys pop up. Um, but if you're more comfortable asking a question in the chat, um, please do. And if there's certain person from the panel that you'd like to direct your question to, um, just pop their name into the chat. Uh, and we'll just use the um, virtual Zoom hand, which I'm terrible. How do you do it? But hopefully everyone knows. Um, and, yeah, so if anyone, yeah, far away with your questions. Um, thanks, Nicola. Nicola's got the thumbs up. Love it. Uh, and I'm just going to check the chat. Um, yeah. Oh, we've got a hand. Oh, oh, Nicola put up your. I might not be able to see everyone. Hang on. I'm just going to slide through. I have got our own gallery. Just in case people don't know about how to put their hands up, if you Thank go to the reactions you. tab at the bottom, that will give you the hands up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so terrible with directions. <laughs> okay. We've got a hand up and we've got a question in the chat. I'll go to the uh, grain. Am I pronouncing that right, grain? Uh, Gronya. Hi, Gronya. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> far away with your question. Um, I don't know if I have a question as such. I, I just resonate a lot with what Nicola has been talking about. I'm a nurse as well. And last year was a challenging year, <laughs> but it was just the end of all of these warning signs, all of these, you know, orange lights, red lights along the way um, and ignoring them um, and just kind of trudging through. And I think sometimes that can be a cultural thing too. You know, for me, like being Irish, it's like, just get on with it. And, you know, like the vocation that nursing is and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I used to go around at work with like sciatic pain consistently and, you know, oh, it was just a thing that happened to me and I just carried on. Um, and then, you know, suffered a back injury um, and it was a small disprotrusion to start with. It was manageable, um, but I came back to work. And also there is a stigma as well around the work cover situation. So I didn't even know about it at the time. That was back in 2018. Nobody really told me about it. I went and found an osteo myself. They said I should go on light duties. None of that was adhered to in my workplace. Um, and then carried on through the years. And then last year I suffered a really bad disc protrusion and had nerve compression down my leg. I couldn't walk for six to eight weeks. I had two injections. I, you know, it was just like insidious is what I say burnout is. It's completely insidious because it's just building and building and building and building and building until you break. Um, so yeah, and again, personal responsibility, system organization and responsibility wasn't there. Um, and only last year through others suffering injuries, both mental, psychological and physical, um, friends of mine, colleagues from 
work um, was I encouraged to go through the work cover process. Um, and I did, and I'm actually still on it to this day, but I'm definitely out the other end. I'm independent employment seeker, as they say now, but, um, and I feel I took months off work, Nicola, as well. I took four or five months off work in total. Um, and it's still not the end as well. You know, it's kind of like, it's always going to be a feature because now I'm even feeling a little bit anxious about going back into the workplace. Although I feel very much ready, I did all the right things, counseling, et cetera, you name it, personal development courses. You know, there was a lot of personal stuff that I had to deal with as well, and that I knew that I was holding within my body um, for years, hadn't addressed it. Um, so there's a lot of that work that everyone needs to do as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's, a, there's a level of anxiety to get back into the workplace again I had an interview yesterday and I felt so drained after it it was like as if it was just bringing up everything for me even though I knew I knew I was able to I performed as good as I could but it was just yeah interesting how it just brought back stuff in my body again about that you know work situation and how I would manage as I go through into the next phase Rania, thank you for yeah, sharing your personal journey with us. That yeah, it takes a lot of courage and really appreciate that. And you like resonated with Nicola's story as well. And yeah. that return to work um is uh, myself, like I took yeah um, six like four or five months off, but I didn't return back to clinical work. But that return back to work, especially when it became the clinical work when I went back to that. Those, that nervousness, that anxiety, even if we've done the work, it's it's such a thing. I end up writing an article on it. I'll include it in, um, if it may be of some help and um, yeah. share a bit Definitely. of my experience. Return to work is a huge step. Even if we've done the work, it yeah. still is. The body remembers, like it remembers. The body keeps the score. Yeah. Yes, exactly. that book, it's a brilliant yeah, book. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. thank um, you. For but sharing. I'm not going back to my previous role, but I'm, I'm you know, venturing into more coordinator type roles. But um, yeah, it's still still comes up yeah thank you Grania. I appreciate your share yeah. I'm just checking the chat a lot of sharing just you know which is beautiful yeah it doesn't have to be a question you may just want to share what reflections have come up for you as you um heard the uh Sarah and Nicola and um and Carolyn speak as well um and I see yeah some shares um happening but yeah feel free to put up your hand if you um yeah want to share yeah April is shared there um yeah I don't think there's any questions. Sorry if I'm missing any. I, I apologize. I do the skimming and then, <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for the shares on the chat. Does anyone else like to, yeah, pop their hand up and share? We still have five minutes and I don't mind going a little bit Sam, over. Yeah, I was just going to say as well, yeah, thanks so much for sharing and giving back as well, because this is what helps everyone just nod and feel supported, feel like you're not alone. But yes. what I would say is if you are on any, you know, any media like LinkedIn or, you know, and find your tribe and connect with Shannon and I, like not everybody likes to network, but if you want to reach out and stay connected and, you know, meet some like-minded people, then I think the peer support, Carolyn, is going to be the way forward I think in these scenarios and it's difficult to know where to find that but also returning to work it really resonates and I think you're feeling exactly the same as everybody else who has been there so just know that the conversations you can have in the workplace you know you need to feel safe but you also need to be supported to be returning to work um so again if you need any support or if that carolyn's got any advice or connections or links even finding a new coach or you know a career advisor i've reached out for some free online sessions and you know haven't paid for things i've actually found people who are willing to connect um, and share some ways forward and it's a good time of reflection but also how you do that re-entry whether that's in the health sector or not so yeah um I think yeah find like owned people and they might have some helpful resources and resources and uh yeah services or programs or peer support that you can link in I think fortunately too the, the psychosocial hazards creates a great lever for you to get what you need from your organization you know where previously a we, we probably lack some education around it so um sharing that information with other people um to your um 
experience you didn't know until other people told you about work cover you know it's almost like the, the hidden ingredients so using that as a lever to get some attention is always really great and and certainly our governments are doing some great workplace health and safety um, education um, but coming back to work is a is another huge gap in organizations at the moment um, where we've got some, you know gentle hands doesn't usually occur it's it's kind of throw in the deep end again and, and see how people whether they sink or swim so there's a lot of work to be done around that mm. um you know sarah when you were talking about the writing down all of the uh, the creative writing i had this image of us all writing stuff down but using paper mache to build something then actually going in and then throwing it to make it smash and i just going that would be so good instead I'm like, I must try and do a workshop like that I don't know I have no artistic creativity whatsoever but the visual image I was just going oh I could enjoy that sort of like a smash room I think we might have we've got a new business idea here people <laughs> <laughs> the therapeutic oh, smash I, rooms <laughs> I love that idea Carolyn um three 3d expression um, I, one thing I do want to uh, kind of mention is I've often seen in the person people like my own personal experience and those I've worked with is that burnout is a catalyst for change. Oh. And, you know, after we've been through it, we can start to see the gifts that we receive from that experience of burnout. When you're going through it, it's impossible. But it does it does encourage us to reflect on ourselves and to make the necessary changes which are all part important parts of our growth and development and I've seen so many people as you know where, where it's such a clear catalyst to change so it's not the end it's a catalyst to change I just wanted to share that I was just reading some of the there's so many beautiful shares and thank you for everyone who's sharing on the chat whether it's you know um thanking others sharing your story it's really beautiful like Nicola has said you know finding a tribe um that was my journey too because I isolated myself um through the ways I was working back then um but um throughout my recovery finding my people by bravely starting to share my story and I and Nicola was one of the people I found and Sarah and um by just yeah connecting um and and learning off their experiences as well and sharing each other and just having someone who's compassionate and and supportive and could hear your story and not not judge you for it but just simply be there and help where they could yeah so I would, would say is if there's people out there Shannon like for me it was I there is a course there was burnout no more but it took a while for me to mm -hmm. find that and find the people you obviously are offering peer support now if I'd have had that and been able to connect and mm -hmm. join a group of people so if there is anyone there definitely explore you know the books and the research that Carolyn and Sarah and Shannon have written because they're the books that I I wish I had read and my younger self had read mm -hmm. um but also the peer support groups and the counseling and psychological support that's out there there are some great safe places now that may be outside of your workforce because not all of us want to go through our workplace mm -hmm. so that's I think the important key to a network or like-minded people is when we don't feel safe or able to somewhere else and just mm -hmm. know there are options, I think I would mm. love to say more than anything. Um, and um, yeah, we're all we're all happy and doing our thing now. So come join us. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just really hard. So I actually wanted to mention earlier, like we, we talk a lot about self-care and self-care is important, but it's collective care. You know, we often we, we heal with you know um amongst others in our tribe you know but finding that tribe because not everyone's meant to it for us or not everyone's going to be where we're at or be what we need and that's okay but collective care um self-care is yeah important but collective care is important too um and that's something i i didn't i only stumbled onto that um phrasing recently through minky um then i always get her name wrong um but she's a uh counsellor registered counsellor working with health professionals in in um, with vicarious trauma and burnout and she's been helpful for me um, but yeah she talks and and works with collective care running groups and things like that and one-on-one -on -one counselling too but yeah um but hey we've got some more messages and before we like we're on seven we've done well with time tonight look at us um go um but I just want to make sure if there's anyone with last minute questions feel free to pop your virtual hand up um just having a look thank you panel two Carolyn's messaging people as well thank you answering questions there 
We will, yeah, definitely. I'll be sending an email to everybody with resources that we've discussed tonight. Um, should be on your preliminary emails, um, links to uh, certainly to Sarah's work, my work and Carolyn's, but I'll, I'll, I will send out another one with all that and others we've mentioned tonight that Nicola's shared as well that has been helpful in her healing journey. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of thank you. Oh, thank you, Zia. My pleasure, um, our pleasure. Um, we're very passionate about this area, um, obviously. <laughs> it comes through, I think. Um, and, yeah, happy to be here and have this kind of forum. Um, so, yeah, if there's no, can anyone, my panel as well, like anyone else that you see there that um, I think, yeah. I think a few people have um, just talked about that when they've tried to raise things in their workplaces and and have really things have felt on deaf ears. Mm. Um and I'm, I'm quite the advocate for using the systems that we have in place um, and certainly workplace health and safety now, uh, inspectors, the, the louder you can shout out, you know, the squeaky wheel, get your, you know, create allyship. You know, if you know that someone else is experiencing the same, you know, go straight above, you know, that's, that's what these government agencies are for. Same with um, fair work, you know, the anti-discrimination respect at work from, the, from December onwards, they have just as many rights to walk into the workplace and basically say, show me, show me how you're creating a positive workplace. Um, show me where it's going to, you know, where you're um, ensuring there's no discrimination for sexual harassment and things like that. So, um, you know, use those escalation procedures if you're not getting what you need. Um, and, and in a good way, um, invite and try and get people like uh, like like any of the panel here today to come and talk to your organisation and um, and to actually do some sessions and you might put it under the guise of it's a, a mental health week information session it might be around some other things uh, mm -hmm. I think later on I'm I'm working with some um, some lawyers and we're doing uh, winefulness. <laughs> winefulness. <laughs> So, uh, you know, you do what you can to kind of go, all right, we can take you on the gentle, gentle approach and, and create a, a, a nice, entertaining way. It's um, small steps sometimes, but mm -hmm. we've certainly got in Australia um, and I know in Canada and I think in the UK as well, some extremely strong um, government bodies that, that are here to help. Carolyn, can I just check? So um, those, well, and this would be Australian for us, so for anyone overseas, sorry that we're not familiar with your services, but that's Safe Work, Work Australia. Like if you're, if it's falling on deaf ears at your workplace, that's where you escalate it to, go to Safe Work Australia or what's, what's uh, the other so systems? It, yeah. it would be each state has a different oh. workplace health and safety um, code. And so it would be going through workplace health and safety um, for respect at work. So anything around sexual harassment, you can go to workplace health and safety because it comes under that. It also comes under the anti-discrimination and it also it's, comes under fair work. Is that a separate body to the organisation? Because when the organisation is not safe, I'm thinking, yeah, those organisations yeah. outside of the organisation. Yeah, yeah. Cool. cool. And each of those have the ability to just turn up without warning and to give notice. Mm. If they don't see improvement, then things Maybe. will yeah maybe we'll include the um i think including those services so um where you're not um safe or is falling on deaf ears which is you know that's a term of not safe um that you know where you can go and who you can talk to and i've had clients in the past access um uh, fair work australia i think and um being able to have an anonymous conversation to start with as well like it, um so just get a feel for that and and where they go from there yeah um yeah so Anyway, they'll be really helpful too. Um, I know some other stuff's coming up in the chat. Is there anything else before we think? Um, someone mentioned that, yeah, Psychology Week this year is about self-care. And I, um, again, I advocate for that, but I'm like collective care people. <laughs> um, but often that is covered in self-care too, like connection and the importance of peer support and having your tribe. So it's certainly part of self-care as well. I think sometimes, you know, language can perpetuate um, not meaning to that this is up to us and we need to take care of us. And yes, we need to look after ourselves, but accepting care from others as well, collective care and, and helping each other out. Yeah. You know, along those lines as well, Shannon, I think that's where when you're a positive, <laughs> you're trying to build positive work culture, a best example when you are, I guess, part of the more senior team, some of the younger next gen uh, are on the beginning of their career journeys and particularly in aged care and, you know, the diversity that is out there. There are some great ways to initiate a positive workplace culture and connection with others. So again, there's, it's always remembering the funds 
stuff too but sharing a lived experience and finding even if it's one or two people that you can share with over lunchtime and you've got mm. some articles and research those lunch and learn opportunities are really really good mm. so if you can be the momentum that your organization needs and be the change you know maker and invite an outside speaker over lunch you can bring some cake then you know <laughs> those sometimes can be really helpful and it might seem small but those tiny changes, like tiny habits that we have to make in recovery, are sometimes what organisations need to. Yeah. One of the things that the research indicates that is a good um, practice for organisations to do is have what you're, you're alluding to, Nicola, like uh, like support type groups but it can be where you are talking about some of this care um, but it can be the challenges at work but it also can be just having fun and connecting as well and whilst I was working in my non-clinical role coming back from burnout I started a a, a group but for, oh, for self-care purposes I really needed it for me and I actually had a manager, a leader who was willing to carve that time because I was like, I'm not using my lunchtime. <laughs> I'm not, that was just, um, but he, I had a willing willing organizational leader to allow us to have an, uh, half an hour um, every month or once a month. I think it was, it ended up being fortnightly um, where, yeah, we got together as a group and it was just, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Sometimes we're learning new skills. Sometimes we're debriefing. Sometimes we were um, just having coffee, <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was. For, yeah connection with our team and um yeah getting through yeah um the challenges with that workplace because it had it every workplace has its challenges but yeah we better I, I feel like we can talk for ages which would be brilliant and maybe I know the team us uh, the panel we've already talked about we should do more of these um which we'd love to so if anyone wants to follow up but we will definitely be in touch with resources um follow-up email so keep an eye out for that um, and when you do log off, a poll will come up too with sharing anything that you want to in terms of what you found helpful or what you may need. Um, so feel free to do that. But thank you so much, everyone, for carving out time in your in your lives for this tonight. That you should you know certainly pat on the back for putting your needs um, and your care um, first here tonight. And um, and thank you to to um, Nicola. Uh, to Sarah and to Carolyn for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom with everyone. Thank you for listening to When Burnout Becomes Reality podcast. This pod relies on the power of its listeners to push it out to the four corners of the earth in hope that it reaches as many people in need as possible. So please like, share, follow, comment or leave a review. Pay it forward and I will be forever grateful. If you'd like to share your burnout to recover experience or you are an expert working in the burnout field and would like to share your wisdom on the pod, please email me at shannonswales at burnoutpsychologysupport.com. To keep up to date with episode releases, please follow us on your favorite podcast provider or by joining our mailing list for at www.burnoutpsychologysupport.com. To check out the burnout psychology services on offer at Burnout Psychology Support, my telehealth practice, visit www.burnoutpsychologysupport.com forward slash psychology services. Once again, thank you for listening and please take care of yourself. Bye for now. Thank you.